Good afternoon. I'm Jeff Sikinga, Executive Director of the Ashbrook Center. I want to thank you for joining us today for our webinar, D-Day and the Liberation of Europe. Uh, so glad that you could be with us today. Um, this is a webinar sponsored by the Ashbrook Center and Teaching American History. Um, many of you know the Ashbrook Center is an independent educational center located at Ashland University in Ashland, Ohio. We run, run programs here on campus and around the country for teachers, for students, and for citizens. And this webinar is another uh, of, of many that we've been doing this past spring, really connected to our mission, which is to educate our fellow Americans in the history and principles of our country and in the habits necessary for self-government with our overall aim of strengthening constitutional self-government in America. So I want to welcome you to this webinar, which is part of that mission. A special welcome, as always, to the teachers who are joining us through the Teaching American History program. We're delighted that you could be here today. So glad to have you with us and so glad to have so many people uh, from around the country today joining us. Uh, this, this webinar is a conversation. It's going to be a conversation today with Dr. John Mosier. And, you know, that's because at Ashbrook, this conversational mode is not on accident. We, we believe profoundly that education is not just about information and certainly not about indoctrination, but about thinking, about discovering the truth. Uh, as I've said many times, we base all our programs on Aristotle's old idea that all human beings desire to know but we add, but they don't want to be told. They want to discover the truth for themselves. So that's what we're going to do today. And we find that the best way to do that, of course, is through conversation, through thinking out loud together with each other and with the great figures of the past. So that's what we're going to do today. We invite you into that conversation. Please feel free to submit questions as always, and we will get to as many of those as we can and try and integrate them into the conversation that Dr. Mosier and I will be having. So thank you for joining us again from around the country. Special welcome to teachers. We thought this would be a, a great opportunity. You know, we're sort of in between Memorial Day here and the and June 6th, which is the anniversary day of D-Day and the invasion of Normandy. And I just want to, in that uh, spirit, give a special um, welcome and thanks to the veterans who are joining us today really appreciate your service a uh, special thank you to my own father who was a veteran who served in the united states army uh, in the 1950s in europe i uh, want to thank all of you for your service uh, as we remember uh, the heroic actions of our service men and women thank you again for joining us uh, to help introduce our speaker today i've asked uh, one of our Ashbrook scholars. You know, we run programs for students here on campus and around the country. One of the on-campus programs we have is the Ashbrook Scholar Program, which is really a, a first-rate program in history and government and political economy for students that draw students from around the country here to study those with us at the Ashbrook Center. And there are Ashland University students who go on to graduate. And we've got one of those with us today to introduce Dr. John Mosier. Uh, Jacob Nessel is a senior Ashbrook scholar who actually, I think, just graduated about three weeks ago. And he is from Murfreesboro, Tennessee. And Jacob originally came to us through the Hilda Bretzloff Ashbrook Academy, which is a wonderful program we run in the summers for students around the country to take a week and study with us the fundamental documents and ideas that define America. And Jacob came to us through that academy. Um, I think he got hooked and <laughs> decided to become an Ashbrook Scholar here at Ashland University and just graduated. He, uh, as a man of, a young man, but a man of many accomplishments, really remarkable. He was a political science major among other majors a really, really fine student. I can say this about him now, now that he's graduated. Um, <laughs> he had an almost perfect uh, 4.0 GPA, one of the very rare students to ever accomplish that. I don't know, he got an A minus somewhere. I don't know, hopefully it was from me. Um, he was a, a representative in the Ashland University Student Senate. He was president of the Young Americans for Liberty 
chapter here on campus, an organization with which he's still involved. And he was the winner of the Ashbrook Scholars Award, which we call the George Washington Award. And we give two uh, awards every year to graduating Ashbrook Scholars. One is the James Madison Award for Excellence in Scholarship and Study. The other is the George Washington Award in Leadership. And we give it to the student who most embodies the statesmanlike qualities possessed by George Washington. And Jacob was the winner of that this year. I think that's a real testimony to, to his character and to the character of the kind of students who become Ashbrook scholars. He's also, I think, got some big things coming up shortly. Uh, he's getting married in just a couple of weeks. <laughs> and I, I also talked to him just before this, looking for a job, <laughs> particularly in development. So if any of you want an outstanding young person, smart, great character, uh, disciplined, uh, to raise some money for you or your organization, <laughs> Jacob looking for a job. Jacob, so much, is, thank you so much uh, for coming today, for joining us from either Tennessee or Kentucky, uh, and from uh, joining us wherever you are, and for introducing Dr. John Mosier. Thank you so much, Dr. Sikinga. Um, actually, uh, you can you can thank uh, <laughs> Dr. Burkett for uh, giving me that that A minus the first time. I got a couple others, but um, that was uh, that was the first one. So um, thank you so much for the kind words, um, and I've really enjoyed my time with Ashbrook. So I'm, I'm pleased to introduce Dr. John Mosier, who um, actually is uh, one of the closest faculty members to me because he was my faculty advisor all four years. Um, and so I'm pleased to introduce him. So he is a uh, professor of history at Ashley University and the chair of the Master of Arts of American History and Government program. He has been with the faculty of Ashland University since 2001. He did his undergraduate work at Ashland University at uh, Ohio University, uh, and he has an MA and PhD in history from the University of Illinois. Dr. Mosher teaches courses on modern European, American, and East Asian history, and he's focused on integrating the innovative reacting to the past games into the classroom. Uh, reacting to the past has students take the part of a historical figure, uh, writing papers, making speeches from their perspective to try to achieve that figure's goals in the course of the game. I speak from my own experience when I say that the reaction to the past games can drive a level of engagement in history that is almost never seen in a lecture-based classroom. It's really an excellent time. Dr. Mosher has also written several books, uh, most recently, the Global Great Depression and the Coming of World War II, uh, which was published in 2015 and focuses on the ways the economic disaster in the 1920s and 1930s paved the way for the Second World War. Um, I just ha have had a fantastic time um, studying under Dr. Mosher, and I'm looking forward to this conversation. So please join me in welcoming Dr. John Mosher. Thank you very much, Jake, uh, Jacob. That's, uh, that's very kind. John, um, you've you, I know we were talking about this right before we came on, you've taken some students, um, Ashbrook scholars like Jacob, to Normandy a few times, maybe three times at least. So, and you've studied, uh, you teach courses on World War II, you've been writing books on the coming of World War II. So I want to, if I can just avail your, uh, us of your expertise in starting off here and help us think as we approach June 6th and the anniversary of D-Day. Um, the, the large question in my mind is, what's the significance of D-Day? Um, and I mean that in the sense of the historical significance of it. Why, how, how important is it for the liberation of Europe? How successful was it actually in affecting that liberation? Um, did it work spectacularly? Did it work okay? Did it work not as well as people had hoped? Um, those kind of questions, historical important questions, but also the moral significance of D-Day. You know, what does it show us about leadership in times of great crisis? What does it show us about courage? Uh, some of the readings you had for us today were really amazing testaments to the courage of ordinary soldiers who landed on, on the beaches there. And what does it show us about America? So just sort of broadly speaking, the, the significance of D-Day. And, and maybe we could start uh, tackling that question by having you just take us back to the months before June 1944. What's the strategic situation facing the Allies and maybe even facing the Germans? And, and how does D-Day and the invasion of France fit into that picture? Okay, the, the first thing that ought to be understood is by 
the beginning of 1944, the tide had clearly turned against against the Germans. The question was no longer whether the Germans would be defeated, but how long it would take. So it's not as though the D-Day invasion marks a turning point in the in the war, in the sense that up until this point, you know, it looked like Germany was winning and then they were losing. Germany was in retreat, certainly on the Eastern Front and in and in Italy. Um, and it, it's 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 possible to do a counterfactual. It said, "What would how, how would the war have been different if D-Day had not happened?" I still think clearly Germany would have lost, but the nature the, the it certainly would have taken a good bit longer, and it would have ended up with a, the post-war world would have ended up looking very very different. Uh, it's it should be remembered that even after the Normandy invasion. Uh, the Germans were facing, or sorry, the um, U.S. forces were only facing about 15 to 20 percent of the German army. Right? The vast majority of the German army was still deployed in the east, and the Red Army was it was advancing. It's it's not to say that the Red Army won the war unaided at all. I mean, American lend-lease aid was critical to the to the success in the east, um, but at but certainly the D-Day invasion made, and, and in fact, the, the invasion of Italy as well, made things much easier for the, uh, for the Soviets. Uh, because there are a number of occasions uh, during Stalingrad, late 1942, and again in the summer of 1943 during the Battle of Kursk, where, where something happens in the West, in North Africa or Sicily or Italy, and, and Hitler orders critical tank panzer divisions to be pulled out of the east to go and put out fires in the west. Obviously, this makes the task easier for the, uh, for the Red Army. But the situation, the situation in, uh, I've just been told my camera is off, so there we go. Uh, the situation as of, uh, of early 1944 was that the Russians were east of what had been Poland, they were still a, a fair distance from the uh, uh, from from Berlin, um, and it's at this point that Hitler really starts uh, starts to worry. One military historian has said that the landings in France in 1944 were the quote the most anticipated event of the whole war. Right, everybody knew there was going to be a landing in Western in, in Western Europe at some point, probably in France. The question of when it was going to come. By the end of 1943, Hitler issues this Führer Directive Number 51, where he says, "All right, I, it's I, I I have a sense that it's not going to be much longer. I have to really start focusing on Western Europe." Uh, he started putting more and more resources into the construction of the so-called Atlantic Wall, the series of defenses that was really supposed to go all along the uh, the French coast and then the coast of the uh, the Low Countries and even up into Denmark. Right? The idea was Fortress Europe is going to be protected from any kind of landing in the West. And why is that so so dangerous? If there's a major force that lands in France, all of Germany is vulnerable in a short period of time, right? The Soviets are pushing, the Red Army's pushing, but that advance is pretty, is pretty slow, and there's a lot of distance. If they land, if the, if, the, uh, if the Allies land in France, then they don't have to advance very, very far at all to get to Germany's industrial heartland uh, along the Franco-German border, the steel, the steel mills, the coal mines, uh, that really, without those things, the German war effort would collapse. Um, so, so if I understand what you're saying, then is because I was looking at this Führer Directive Number Fifty One, which is given months and months before June uh, 1944. It's November of 1943, but it's clear there that Hitler is um, his primary concern originally, perhaps, is the after the conquest of France is, of course, attacking Russia, and he said he calls it the bitter and costly struggle against Bolshevism, and that's occupied most of the German war effort. By, by November 43, it's at least a stalemate if they haven't already been sort of beaten back from places like Leningrad and Stalingrad. Um, but it's interesting to me when I'm looking at this document, um, was this, you said it's the most anticipated event <laughs> of the war. Everybody knows there's going to be an invasion, but they didn't know where it was going to be, right. and they didn't know when it was going to be. And we know that Stalin kept pushing 
uh, Franklin Roosevelt and Churchill, open a Western front, open a Western front. And in fact, he wanted them to do it very early on, I think, right, in, in 42. But they decided to go in the invasion of North Africa and then sort of work their way up from the south and into Italy. Um, can you talk a little bit more about how D-Day figures into uh, when and how it happens, how it figures into the Russian uh, alliance and uh, or sort of alliance alliance with the Americans and the British? It, it, this became a major bone of contention between Stalin and the Western Allies, because almost immediately after Pearl Harbor, when, when the, the so-called Grand Alliance comes together, the first thing that the Soviets are asking for is a second front, by, by which they meant a landing in France. And uh, President Roosevelt, along with Army Chief of Staff George Marshall, suggested in early in 1942 that it might be possible that year. Certainly in the U.S. Army, there was a big push for a landing in 1942. Not on the scale of the one that actually took place in 44, but supposed to be just big enough to draw forces away from, from the East. And uh, once Churchill found out about these plans, he said, oh, that, that this would be crazy. And Churchill convinced FDR that it would be a really bad idea to try to land in France in 1942. Um, and FDR said, well, we have to get U.S. forces in action against the Germans somewhere. Uh, North Africa so sounded like a good alternative. It did not sound like a good alternative to Stalin. Stalin was convinced that the, the Anglo-American strategy was to, uh, Stalin being Stalin, was, his mind was inclined to work like this, uh, that the plan was to bleed the Soviet Union as long as possible by letting the Germans have their, you know, keep you know, keep attacking, and then they would sort of, they would land on the continent as kind of a mopping up operation, and this really did poison relations uh, and create and really created uh, a lot. I mean, look, there was distrust and distrust within the alliance from the very beginning because that was the nature of the Soviet regime, but the but the failure of the uh, uh, the the U.S. and Great Britain to commit to a landing in nineteen in France in nineteen forty two was uh, uh, Stalin, Stalin definitely saw that as, as bad faith. And, and one of our questioners has already asked a question, we're getting them rolling in now. Um, how significant do you think that delay was in the later developments of the Cold War and in the real frosty aspect of the relationship at the end of, of the war? Yeah, I mean, I think there would have been a Cold War you know, it, when, when I when I want to list the reasons why there was a Cold War after nineteen after the end of the war, I would put the Second Front very low. I mean, it, 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 it there are fundamental disagreements between them on the on the on what on the shape of the post war world. So there was no way that there was going to be continued cooperation. But uh, the, the I think the the best way to put it is. The, the lack of a second front in 1942 or 1943 doesn't help relations. So um, the, Hitler clearly is expecting um, some invasion in the West, starts to shift forces and orders this Fuhrer directive to shift forces. Um, and and I, I mentioned this to you before, but I think to me this was really interesting, um, partly because I have relatives who came from Denmark uh, on my mother's side, um, that they also seem to, they didn't seem to know quite where an invasion might come. And so can you talk about the Allies, uh, their strategy for deciding where to invade, and then how they try to deceive the Germans about where they would invade? Because Hitler thinks, for example, he talks about the possibility of a large-scale offensive against Denmark. The, the realistic places where a large-scale landing could take place were actually pretty limited. It had to be northern France. Um, so, and, and the requirements were basically three. One, it had to be a coastline that had a beach, and that ruled out certain stretches that were really just cliffs. It had to be within the comfortable range of fighters. And I'm not talking about Mustangs, which had really considerable range. Uh, there were a lot more Spitfires than there, uh, than there were Mustangs. And Spitfires could only operate within a, within a very limited range. Uh, they could not have they, they could not have engaged in operations over Norway or Norway or Denmark, so it really meant northern uh, northern France. And there were only really two locations in northern France that were possible. Uh, one was the Pas de Calais, which was the closest point 
between uh, between continental Europe and and uh, the UK, uh, and the other was and the other was Normandy. Now the question was, how do we convince Hitler that the landing is going to be anywhere but Normandy? And this was a this was a long term uh, scheme of uh, of misdirection called Operation Fortitude, and there were different variants of it. Uh, one was to suggest that there were going to be landings in Norway, others in Denmark. The biggest one was to convince to convince Hitler that the landing was going to be at at Pas de Calais. And I mean, the the extent to which uh, all, the Allies went to try to convince him of this is really incredible. You may have heard stories about the inflatable tanks that were uh, that were set up. Uh, it was announced the first U.S. Army group was created. And it was a completely fictional army group. But what really seemed to make it real was the fact that George Patton was named its commander. And the Germans knew Patton. They knew him by reputation. They'd already, uh, they'd already dealt, with it, dealt with him before. And they had a lot of respect for him. Um, now, the fact was, Patton was kind of being punished because of his episode in, uh, in, in, in Sicily where he slapped, those, uh, he slapped that soldier. So he was he was in the doghouse. So he wasn't going to be part of the initial Normandy operation, but they named him uh, uh, head of first of first U.S. Army Group. I mean, the Germans did not. It would not have computed to the average German soldier or officer that Patton would have been punished for slapping one of his subordinates. That happened. That and worse happened regularly within the German army. That's you know, that, that was just a regular uh, a regular feature. Um, so they they figured well, if Patton is in charge of this first U.S. Army group, it's it, it has to be uh, to be real. Oddly, <laughs> excuse me, the one guy who thought it might not be real, was Hitler himself. And Hitler, if you look throughout his, his career, and certainly during the war, he was the big fan of the unexpected strike. And he thought, boy, this looks too easy, like we're being fed a line on this. But when his two most important subordinates in the West, Erwin Rommel, the the Desert Fox from North Africa, and Gerd von Rundstedt, who also had a very distinguished military career, they disagreed on a whole lot in terms of defending France. But the one thing they were agreed on was, oh yes, it's going to be Pas de Calais. So Hitler let himself be convinced that the invasion was uh, uh, was, was was going to be there. At the same time, he was he was concerned enough about landings in Denmark or Norway to keep substantial forces concentrated in those areas where there was never any kind of allied offensive at all. They, they hung out, the German soldiers were up, were, were there until they learned of the surrender. So then take us through the planning uh, in the weeks that's right coming up to June. So one thing that we that we hear about in even in the readings you gave for to us is weather. Weather seems to be an important issue. Uh, if you're gonna launch this large, the largest in history, seaborne invasion, uh, particularly with 1944 materiel, um, boats and all the rest, you got to have good weather. So when they decide to to pull the trigger and do an invasion in Normandy of France, what day did they decide to do that? And then what were the steps that took to get us to June 6th as opposed to May or July or some other time? Yeah, in terms of timing, they wanted a few things to, to, to coincide. For one thing, they wanted it to be a full moon or as close to a full moon as possible uh, because they knew there was going to be a major airborne operation between the German lines. So there had to be the night before some kind of light for these, for these airborne forces to work by. Uh, it also, it, it, the, the invasion had to come at low tide, but as close as possible to dawn so that the landing troops would have the benefit of, dawn's, of, of, of the light of dawn. But the reason it had to be low tide was the Germans had all kinds of obstacles on the beaches. That when high, it, during higher tides, those obstacles were concealed under the water and landing craft would have gotten hung up on them. That was exactly the whole purpose between putting them there. So it had to be low tide, at, at low tide coinciding with dawn on a night with a full moon and the weather had to be good enough that aircraft could fly. And uh, yeah, there was there, there was talk originally about doing it, at, doing it in May. Weather didn't cooperate. It gets pushed back to uh, to June. June fifth was uh, was considered the go time. And, and one thing that Eisenhower and his staff uh, 
uh, in uh, uh, you know across the channel near Portsmouth, we're we're looking at all the time were the weather reports. And uh, the morning of, of June 5th, of course, by this time it had already been decided it wasn't going to happen on June 5th because of the forecasts. But Eisenhower reported waking up on the morning of June 5th that with the storm so severe that his, the, 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 the trailer where he was sleeping was, it was literally shaking. So there was no way it could happen in that situation. And it didn't look much better for the 6th either. So there's this big meeting on the uh, on the on the fifth. Do we go forward with tomorrow? Well, one of uh, his his uh, his chief assistant who was paying attention to the weather came in with a latest report, and he said there is going to be a break on the morning of uh, or you know, like in the wee hours of June fifth. It's going to be terrible again later or June June sixth rather. It's going to get terrible again on the sixth, and it's terrible on the fifth. The 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 awesome decision. That, that Eisenhower defaces, do we go forward with this? I mean, is this little break in the weather going to be long enough to give us what we needed? If we didn't, we're going to have to push it back to the next full moon. So it's going to be early July with all the, you know, attending uh, attending problems there. So he, he does make that decision to uh, to move forward on, uh, on on the 6th. And that night, he meets with the airborne troops before they uh, before they go into the air. Uh, he meets, uh, you know, he meets with the with the with the troops who are about to board the uh, the transports who are going to take them to the landing craft, and uh, and at some point he just has to put up his hands and say, "This is going to happen now." Wow. So so the decision Ike's decision is in some ways dependent on a weather report. Yeah, absolutely. Which and, and you know that that's one of the reasons why if you looked at those those two notes that he had, he he had drawn up the announcement. Of the uh, that the landings have been successful, but he also wrote down on the fifth that very short one saying it didn't work. The fault is all mine. I take full responsibility. Uh, that was the letter he kept in his uh, in his jacket pocket all day on the sixth. That fortunately he never had to uh, he never had to give anyone. Let's can we talk a little bit about that because those those his his note to the uh, soldiers to the British and American soldiers who are invading uh, is really remarkable. Um, and and that handwritten note is perhaps in some ways even more remarkable. Um, Eisenhower is such an important figure in this. Can you tell us a little bit about how Eisenhower becomes supreme commander of the Allied Expeditionary Force, which of course in end makes is such an important part of his career, going on to become president of the United States and all the rest. How does he get chosen? Um, are there fights about this? Is he the obvious choice for everybody? Um, and then what kind of well, how does Ike handle this enormous task? Yeah, it. In some ways, he seemed like a dark horse candidate at the uh, at the beginning of U.S. involvement in the war. The, the the person who really wanted the job, and who, you know, under an ordinary ordinary circumstances, probably would have gotten it was Army Chief of Staff George Marshall. George Marshall had been uh, General Pershing's aide in World War I, so he had been part of the American Expeditionary Force then. And he, his, his fondest dream was to be able to do the same thing in this, or to, to do what Pershing did in the First World War in the Second. Um, FDR said, no way. And the reason for it was, he said, I, I rely on General Marshall too much. Occasionally, he got a little too familiar with General Marshall. There's a, there's a story that he joked with him and called him George, and and that the, the General Marshall just fixed him with his steely glare. Of course, he didn't say anything. I would have been insubordination. The president was commander in chief, but FDR never did that. Uh, never did that again. FDR liked to be informal with everybody. Um, Marshall, some said, had the bearing of George Washington, but one, but but somebody who was or one body of of men. Who was very impressed with George Marshall were, 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 was the U.S. Congress. Uh, so many times when Congress wanted or talked about doing something that that might have been detrimental to the war effort, FDR would send Marshall to testify or or to talk to individual congressmen and senators, and they all listened to him. I mean, it was it, he was like the reincarnation of George of, of George Washington. Um, uh, though obviously he had less George Washington had less impact on the Continental Congress than uh, than than uh, uh, George Marshall did on the U.S. Congress at this time. So FDR said, "I can't spare you. I, I uh, you have to stay here in Washington." 
That was a big disappointment for Marshall, obviously. But Eisenhower, um, I th ultimately, I think what qualified him for the job was his the long time he spent as aide to uh, another famous general, Douglas MacArthur. He was his 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 uh, MacArthur's aide during the, uh, the the bonus march in 1932, um, and later on in the Philippines, uh, MacArthur was became commander and uh, overall commander of the Philippine army, and and Eisenhower. <sighs> Eisenhower claimed that the two always got along fundamentally, but they had major disagreements about a lot of things. And this is what really qualified Eisenhower for the job of Supreme Commander of, of the uh, Allied Expedition, Expeditionary Force. It was understood that he was going to have to deal with some difficult people. Um, George Patton. Uh, uh, Bernard Montgomery. I mean, <laughs> Montgomery, by the way, was convinced that he should be commanding things, but no, it was going to be an American commander in this. Uh, and, uh, and just for those who might not know, who was Bernard Montgomery? He was. Uh, he, he was a, a, a British general. Uh, he was, a, it, in many ways, he deserves the term great. He was architect of of success in North Africa. I'm not talking about Operation Torch, but he commanded the the, the uh, uh, British forces in Egypt. Uh, that defeated Rommel at uh, in, the, in the two battles of El Alamein earlier in nineteen in in, uh, in mid nineteen forty two July and then October. Um, he was uh, he was insufferable as just about anybody who had to deal with him would say. His own troops loved him. By the way, he was an He was he was a well loved commander, but other generals did not get along. He was a total prima donna. Of course, so was so was Patton. Um, and, and Patton and Montgomery loathed one another. So whoever was going to be supreme commander of allied forces was going to have to deal with these very strong personalities. And uh, Eisenhower developed his reputation for being able to do that from working with MacArthur. Uh, he, on the one hand, he was not a pushover. He was not afraid to tell MacArthur what he thought. On the other hand, he didn't try to you know, subvert those, the, the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, this, the chain of command, right? He, he never became in, insubordinate. He handled it well. And, and he also had what we might, you know, what, what we in Ohio often call Midwestern nice. Right? He, he, was, he got along with people. Was, was Eisenhower a military genius? No. Uh, he was a very good organizer, but most importantly, he could bring together people who could, could not stand one another and build a team that was capable of, of, of accomplishing something of this magnitude. That goes to a question that one of our attendees has asked, which says, didn't MacArthur say that Ike was the best clerk he ever had? <laughs> Meaning <laughs> yeah. that he was best suited as a staff officer, not as a general in charge of strategy. Yeah. yeah is that's... that fair or is that not fair? No, it, I mean, it's not like he didn't have any kind of experience in combat command. I mean, he did oversee the, uh, the, the, the torch landings in November of 1942. Um, he was, I mean, there were some missteps. Uh, the Battle of Kasserine Pass is, now most of that was, uh, was a subordinate officer. That, that he was a little bit slow to remove from command. That, that was part of the, uh, the Allied invasion of Italy? Uh, what well, the Kasserine Pass was in North Africa. It was in the North first Africa. time. It was the first time that U.S. forces went up against German forces, and it did not go well for the for for the U.S. Uh, uh, for for U.S. troops. One thing that the, the the British always observed was that U.S. troops were supremely self confident, um, and there's a certain benefit to that, but it could also be unwarranted. They 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 kind of went into the war with the attitude that okay. Now America's in the war. This is, you know, this is this is just about uh, just about done. And, and by the way, this came up in the fight over uh, between FDR and Churchill over whether to do a landing in France in, in 1942. Um, the British general said, you know, he, you know, God bless the United States. We're so glad you're in the war with us. But you have never fought the Germans before. They are they are really tough, and uh, we're afraid that if we if we attempt a landing in 1942, and you know, I don't. There are a million reasons why a landing in 1942 would have been a bad idea. Uh, it could be a real disaster, and who knows how long it will be before we could try again. Uh, and that was ultimately what swayed uh, what swayed FDR. Although he did insist on the North African landings as a substitute. So, so Eisenhower 
is put in charge. He's put in command. He, he does seem, am I right, to be able to bring these very difficult personalities together. And maybe his genius then is not so much in innovative strategic thinking, but in the capacity to bring together a lot of very bright, very ambitious people and figure out how to get each one to do the right thing for the overall uh, effort, right? Mm -hmm. And there's, that's a real talent. Uh, that's not easy. Um, but then they decide to pull the trigger that short weather break, June 6, 1944. Talk a little bit about, and we've had a couple of questions about this. Um, what is, what's happening by sea and by air bombarding the German positions to coming in? And what about the French resistance and the role that they play either in intelligence or sabotage coming up to the day of June 6, 1944? Yeah. Anyone who's watched, uh, the, the, the film, the longest day, uh, probably remember the, the, that, uh, the, Be the first notes of Beethoven's Fifth Symphony would be played as kind of a signal that it would be played uh, via the shortwave radio as a signal to French resistance that was going to happen. But the, but the French resistance, just like anyone, had a, had a very good, I good idea that there was going to be a landing in France. So they had been engaged for some time in, in acts of sabotage. And then those that campaign stepped up in the months leading to the, uh, to the landings. Also, uh, there were God, there was almost constant bombing of the area. I mean, much of much of northern France was obliterated before the landings even uh, even took place. Uh, tore up the roads, tore up the railroads for reasons that aren't hard to to find. If, if the railroad, if the roads and the railroads of northern France are a mess, it becomes very very difficult for the Germans to commit reinforcements to the area. Uh, so uh, you know, thousands of, of thousands of tons of bombs were dropped on uh, on northern France, uh, with by the way, great loss of life to French civilians. The French understood, um, but uh, but it was but this was a this was not have been a good time to live in northern France at all. Um, then the airborne operation happens during the you know during the night of June fifth sixth, and that could have well been a disaster. Uh, these planes had to fly in formation, carrying paratroopers, in, in in straight lines, and you didn't want to have a bunch of lights on these planes because you didn't want them want them to be spotted. Each one had a single rear light on, which which gave the plane behind it something to to focus on. Well, no sooner had these planes gotten over the uh, over uh, uh, you know, across the English Channel, but they ran into a massive cloud bank. What happened? Some planes went up and over, some went down and under, some went through, some went to the right, some went to the left. This, this well-orchestrated plan for these planes to fly in formation completely fell apart. And then they got, they said, well, we're over France now. I guess we'll just, we'll just have the, par the, uh, the paratroopers go. And they drop in, instead of dropping in some kind of good order behind the German lines, they're kind of scattered all over northern France in small numbers. This could have been really disastrous, but it ended up working out pretty well because before too long, German radio was abuzz with reports, you know, enemy activity here, enemy activity here, here. It's, it's happening all over the place. So this ends up producing chaos in the uh, in the German in the German ranks. So even though I mean the original thought was enough of them are going to land in a small enough area that they can really mount a, a, an action against the German rear. That doesn't really work out. But their very presence carrying out individual acts of uh, you know individual attacks on isolated German forces creates enough confusion to distract the Germans. So so take us then to June sixth. We have, this, we have this amazing, we have this amazing account, firsthand account from Robert Edlin of the 2nd Ranger Battalion of what it's like to actually storm the beaches. Yeah. One of, one of the questions that has asked was, why was Omaha Beach, the, the beach where the Americans land and so famous to us, why was it so such a terrible place to land compared to yeah. some of the other beaches? This account is just harrowing. He's shot in both legs. He can only crawl back and forth. He, he comes across one fellow who thinks, he thinks he's going to be dead because he's been shot clear through. I mean, the loss of the casualty percentage must have been really high. So, yeah. so what happens on that day 
in, in, in Omaha Beach and the other beaches when they actually land and make it ashore? They, well, they, they're, there's, their landing is on five different beaches. Omaha is by far the most, uh, the most difficult. In fact, the casualties at Omaha Beach were roughly equal to casualties on all the other beaches combined. Uh, and there were a few reasons for this. For one thing, bad luck. The very best German forces in the West were concentrated there. Generally speaking, the best German troops were not assigned to France. Now, Hitler in November 1943 starts to change this. Um, but but you know, France up until that point had always been kind of where troops on R and R or troops that are not particularly units that are not particularly reliable. They're you know they're on France. They're in France because nothing's expected to happen there. But Hitler starts moving some really good forces there at the end of at the end of forty three. The best ones just happen to be uh, in uh, to be in the area near uh, near Omaha Beach. Secondly, I told you about the Atlantic Wall. Uh, the Atlantic Wall never came close to being finished. However, the section around Omaha Beach was more developed than the defenses around the uh, around the other ones. And the Atlantic Wall is this combination of obstacles, gun emplacements, pillboxes where machine yes. guns would be, things like that, mines, yes. and all of that stuff. Yep. Many of these, by the way, if you if you visit Normandy today, you can go visit those pillboxes. If you, uh, I mean. I encourage anyone who travels to, to northern France to stand on that beach and look up at the uh, at, at 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 the at the landscape, and you think, what an amazing uh, what an amazing feat it was to accomplish this. By the way, every year at Conneaut, Ohio, uh, uh, World War II reenactors from all over the country converge on this little town because its little stretch of coastline on Lake Erie kind of resembles. The, uh, the, Nor the Normandy coast. So they do this amazing reenactment of, uh, uh, of, of Normandy, which is, uh, which is kind of uh, impressive to see. But, but yeah, it's, it, this, was, this was some task. Uh, the Germans occupied high ground. They had lots of defenses. They were reliable, seasoned troops. And added to the, to the problems was that the landing craft ended up opening sooner than expected. Uh, some of them, like the the account that you read, they ran onto sandbars. Other landing the landing craft saw this and said, "Oh, this is where we're letting them off." Also, the landing craft were facing devastating fire from the from from shore. So, so you know, the people who were piloting these landing craft were anxious to get these guys unloaded and to and, and to head back. The problem was where they emptied the, the, the water in the places where they let off these guys was deeper than expected. A lot of guys drowned as soon as they stepped off the, uh, off the landing curve. Because remember, they're carrying you know, 40, 40 or more pounds of, of, of equipment on their, on their backs, right? We think, oh, all right, we jump into water, we're going to tread water for a while. Yeah, that's really hard with the amount of, uh, the, the amount of equipment they hold. So they got, you know, a, a number of them just got dragged to the bottom immediately. Uh, also, there were supposed to be tanks. Right? One of the reasons why things went comparatively well on the other uh, on the other beaches was that tanks landed and the infantry could advance behind behind the tanks. The tanks, uh, almost all the tanks at Omaha at Omaha Beach, just immediately went to the bottom when when they were released. So these infantry did not have armor support. Uh, when they got to the beach, they were entirely exposed. The only hope they had was the beach obstacles that uh, uh, that, that that the Germans had put there. And on the way, we had a questioner say, "On the way over, what about German U-boats? Because early in the war, German U-boats had been taking a terrible toll on uh, Allied shipping and na and naval vessels. Why weren't they able, or did they slow down the crossing, or did they have an effect on the landings?" Yeah, that's a great question. It was one of the arguments that was made to dissuade FDR from ordering an invasion in 1942. I mean, German German submarines were prowling the Atlantic. That would have been too too risky. And there's there's a whole other amazing story about how the landing how how the Armada for Operation Torch was able to avoid U-boats because they did so right during the time when U-boats were the biggest threat. But starting in the middle of 1943, the tide had really turned against the U-boats. Uh, thanks to a number of factors, most importantly the fact that the German naval code had been broken. So uh, it was 
by by mid 1944, it was. I don't want to say U boats weren't operating anymore, but they tended to be in places like the Indian Ocean, uh, far away stations where they could still do damage to shipping, but they weren't nearly the threat that they had been in uh, 1942 and early 1943. So we, a beachhead is established even in terrible places like Omaha, right? Yeah. Um, and these amazing stories of courage. Um, and as he says, one place he says, uh, he, he sees some soldiers and he says, they were worn out and defeated completely. <laughs> there really wasn't anyone left to help them. But then he says, then he yells at a bunch of rangers and says, now get up and go up there and take those cliffs. And he says, amazingly, they all took off and did it. Yeah. Well, the, the alternative, there was no way to get off the beach. Uh, you, you no way to go back. There was no retreating. So if you stayed on the beach, you were going to die. And this was this became, this is how how you motivated troops to to go onward because that was the that was the really all, real only alternative. Uh, as, as long as German gunfire could rake the beach, everybody down there was was going to be doomed unless those gun emplacements and pillboxes could be uh, could be dealt with. Wow! So amazingly, they they established this beachhead even in a really tough place like Omaha. What what's the casualty rate? Do we know? For, for yeah, the American it, troops at Omaha, Omaha Beach, there were about two thousand dead, wounded, and missing. Uh, and and like I said, that's about equivalent to the casualties on all the other beaches combined. Now, one by focusing on June sixth, that can be a little bit misleading because the Normandy campaign goes on for another six weeks before Normandy is secure, and then and then. You know, soon France France is liberated. Not long after that, but uh, you know, some of the beaches where the landings were—I mean, all the landings were contested, but nowhere, you know, none of the other beaches was the was the resistance as fierce as at Omaha. So many of the these 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 British and Canadian and U.S. units as well uh, that 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 made it ashore on this first day and had a much easier time than the men who hit uh, hit Omaha Beach they would run into big problems in the days that followed i mean the british british troops made it uh you know made it ashore without you know without too many casualties on 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 june 6th but outside of Caen, the germans were really the the, the city of Caen in, in normandy the the the, uh, the germans were really dug in there and uh it took it took weeks for the british to be able to to drive them out so there was the, the it, it, it's it, it while it's 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 understandable that people want to focus on the landings themselves the fighting that happened in the coming six weeks was just as important and there's a lot of casualties how is d-day reported back to america with the high casualties some some one of our attenders wants to know does eisenhower end up being compared to u.s grant like you know willing to just throw him in and in front and get him killed for the sake of a per, for the sake of operation or is d-day hailed as a triumph, even during that six weeks when there's intense fighting. Oh, it was it was hailed as a as a triumph, and and I'm I'm trying to think now. My sense is, exact uh, casualty counts would not have been released immediately, so there would, would have been a narrative established right off. This was a great victory, and then later it becomes known uh, uh, how many uh, how many losses there there were. Um, I don't. Uh, yeah, I I can't think of. I mean. It, it, there was bound to have been some criticism, but I don't know that. I don't. I don't. I don't think that was prominent. And, and so the Germans are facing this. It, it, there is a ferocious debate, as I understand it, between the Germans as what's our strategy of, of counterattack? Do we mass all our troops right on the shore and keep them off from even getting on the shore, or do we let them land and then counterattack? Yeah. And you got really important people, like you said, like Rundstedt and also Rommel. And Rommel, not much long after this, is implicated in the plot to assassinate Hitler. So, tell us a little bit about what the Germans are thinking and facing at this time. Yeah, the, the, there is this debate. Um, uh, uh, Rundstedt believes that um, uh, Rundstedt believes that, that that. Do I have that? Do I have them reversed now? Uh, wait a minute. I have this in my notes. Okay, uh, Rundstedt said, "Keep our forces concentrated away from the beaches." It's kind of a mobile force. To, to go wherever, because we can't be sure where exactly they're going to land. We keep them back from the beach, and, and they can go wherever uh, wherever they're needed. Rommel said, that's that's a bad idea, because 
the communicate the transportation network in northern France is so bad that they're not going to get there in time. So those forces need to be right up against the coast. And uh, even though Rommel was nominally subordinate to to Rundstedt, Rommel was as big as a rock star in the German army as there is as you could imagine. So, uh, so so he felt free to to you know to 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 to, to completely disagree with uh, with Rundstedt. And Hitler got involved personally, as he often did. He was in, in overall command of the German army. Uh, he said, "We're going to um, we're going to keep." A force. We're going to have some right on the coast, but we're going to keep a force in reserve, a, a, you know, a, 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 a Panzer force in reserve. But only I can authorize their release. So he had to personally issue the command for this Panzer force to go. Rommel couldn't do it. Rundstedt couldn't do it. And uh, while the invasion is occurring on the morning of June 6th, they try to reach Hitler. And they're informed that Hitler's asleep. Uh, Hitler was not sleeping well these days. He had taken a sleeping pill, uh, and his, and Hitler's aides were they did not want to wake wake him up during this peaceful slumber. Uh, well, as soon as he woke up, he was informed what was going on, and by that time, some precious hours had been uh, had been lost. So this this disagreement among the leading commanders. Uh, Hitler's uh, incapacity at this uh, at this particular time definitely contributed to the Allied victory. So, in the six weeks that happens after that, what you know, if we're looking at this and saying, what's the significance of D-Day in liberation of Europe? Um, is it a success overall, in your opinion? Uh, and, and what were or were there some big mistakes that the Allies made that? They didn't have to make because some people may have seen in one of my favorite World War II movies is called A Bridge Too Far, which is about Operation Market Garden and the attempt to in, in, get to Germany by invading through the Netherlands, which ends up going a bridge too far and being a sort of spectacular failure. Um, is D-Day itself and the invasion, is it a success a, as successful as we sometimes think in the liberation of Europe? Yeah, I think I think the landings themselves have to be counted as a, as 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 a pretty dramatic success. I mean, the death the, the toll the death toll was high, but it could have been much much worse. Um, one of the mistakes that was made early on was farther inland when uh, when Allied troops encounter the the hedgerows, the bocage. And it becomes natural defensive terrain. It's one of the reasons why, even though the landings go off pretty well. It takes weeks to secure the rest of Normandy and to break out from these uh, from from these positions. So one can look at plenty of, of errors in the in the months that came. Market Gardens, another another good example. Uh, the Battle of the Bulge, just you know, there, a complacency had set in by December, allowing the Germans to mount this massive counteroffensive. So there are plenty of mistakes, but D Day was D Day. I think went off about as well as as could be uh, as could be expected. I, if I could say something about supply, because this was the critical short-term problem. Once you get thousands and thousands of men on shore, how do you get them the fuel and the ammunition and the food and everything else that they need? Um, it was understood it would be a long time before the Allies were going to be able to capture a port. They got Cherbourg in late June, but the Germans had devastated the port facilities before they, uh, you know, before the it, before it was taken. So you couldn't bring in supply that way. Well, this was this problem was anticipated through the construction of the mulberries, these giant artificial harbors that were constructed, massive concrete caissons dropped into the English Channel, uh, and 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 you know metal uh, pilings laid over them. So that you had, uh, so it was possible for for ships to sail right up in there to dock, and then supplies could be brought onto shore. This was this was probably the most amazing feat of engineering in the entire war, and it was it, it was it, it, through the mulberries forces in France were able to be supplied uh, uh, until major ports could be captured. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about then. Um, what do we see about the American troops? Maybe if we can make a general comment, what do we see about the American character in the way that the, 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 the D-Day is carried out, the, the way that the troops sort of um, adapt to situations like dealing with the hedgerows? What's interesting to you as a historian about what you see about Americans 
in this in this uh, military campaign. Yeah, I mean they're certainly brave and dedicated. I mean, my my favorite story of of American heroism in the Normandy invasion uh, is uh, Point du Hoc, which uh, Ronald Reagan famously gave uh, gave this address there. And I visited Point du Hoc, and this is a this was not a beach area, right? There were not going to be landings at point at Point du Hoc because it was it was basically straight up to get there. Well, the Germans had had these guns there that. Uh, it was expected they would use to lob shells down on beaches in both directions. So these U.S. Army Rangers were assigned to take out these uh, to, to take out these 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 uh, artillery pieces. Um, they approached on rubber rafts and climbed up ladders to the top of this uh, you know up this precipice. You know, with Germans firing down at. Now they get up there and then they realized that the guns had been moved inland. Uh, they, they didn't get up there and say, "Well, oh, I guess there's nothing to do." No, they went inland. They found the guns and they destroyed and they destroyed them any, anyway to make sure they wouldn't be brought into action. So this this, this an amazing case of, uh, of of bravery going on, inventiveness. Yeah, I mean there were there were eventually ways to uh, uh, to 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 deal with the bocage. Uh, one of the one of the most interesting ways were actually the use of um, uh, this was British. Uh, the, these British tanks, they were called, well, British, was a British general named Hobart who, uh, who adapted tanks to various purposes. And uh, one was to, to put these chains on the front, right? And they would spin and they would cut their way through the bocage. So yeah, I mean, necessity being the mother of invention, it was, it was never, uh, never so true. Yeah, so let me, to those of you who are, uh, let me just second John's uh, mention there of Pandu Hawk and Ronald Reagan's address, which I think was given in the 40th anniversary of D-Day, I believe, in June of 1984. It's a wonderful address on the significance of that, that place and that moment and what it means for America. I think that, thanks for that reference, John. That's a, that's a great thing. Anybody can look that up online and find that speech. Um, thank you, John. Boy, the time has just flown past. This is fantastic. Thank you so much. <laughs> I can see why the students really enjoy going to Normandy with you <laughs> when you take those Ashbrook Scholars. That's great. I hope we can do that again. <laughs> yeah. Circumstances permitting, that would be fantastic. And I want to thank all of you for joining us uh, today in this conversation. Thanks for all of your questions. I know we didn't get a chance to get to all of them, and there's some really good ones. You know, you should feel free to send Professor Moser a note. He's a friendly guy. I'm sure he'll be happy to answer some of those questions that you might have for him uh, on, on D-Day and the liberation of Europe. Uh, again, thank you so much to the teachers who are joining us in Teaching American History program. We, we uh, especially appreciate you being here. And again, to our veterans uh, who served, uh, we, we deeply appreciate your service to this country. And thank you for coming. Um, uh, we are um, continuing, you know, the, this series, as I said, is part of our mission at Ashbrook to strengthen constitutional self-government by educating ourselves. And in a really important moment like this, uh, in World War II about um, the meaning of America and the principles and character uh, of America and what we, how we see those in these really defining moments in world history. So thank you for joining us. Really do appreciate it. You'll be sent after this um, from your registration a link with a recording of this webinar. Please use that uh, recording. Please send it to your friends and relatives, children, grandchildren, teachers, those of you who are still schooling your own children at home. Please. Uh, use this. John is a is a great expert in World War II. Um, this is this has just been really interesting and helpful and informative to me. I always learn from this. So I want to thank you again, John, for doing that. And folks, please send that out. You know, our idea is that we can learn from history. We can gain some historical perspective on the current issues we face. That there are really enduring questions of leadership, of character, of heroism, of strategic thinking. All those things that we see in those episodes in 1944, which we can think about and apply for today, and, and to renew our own understanding of America and what it means to be an American. So thank you for joining us. Uh, these kind of moments, you see the kind of stories John was telling about American heroism, and it, it gives us hope um, that we can see how high and how well Americans of the past conducted themselves, and gives us a model for conducting ourselves in the way we think and the way we talk and the way we act as citizens. So thank you for joining us and for that hope, John. And uh, as always, I wanna to say to everybody, stay healthy, stay hopeful, and stay connected with Ashbrook.
Thanks for joining us.